Welcome back, everybody. Joining me now is the co-founder of Microsoft and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Please welcome Bill Gates. Hi, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's nice to see your house. <laughs> it's nice to see yours too, or unless you're broadcasting to us from the billionaire bunker at the center of the moon you share with Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yeah, the club. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's not is it to cook? Elon Musk's? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, sir, everybody's talking about the TED talk you gave in 2015 uh, about the, uh, the crisis that a coming pandemic would mean. Um, why was this so obvious to you and others that this was something that we had to prepare for? Well, once a disease is human to human transmissible, then it can spread across the globe because there's so much international travel. We're more at risk today than any time in history. Uh, either a flu or coronavirus like that literally could kill uh, tens of millions. And so we should have practiced. We should have said, okay, who's gonna set up the testing really quickly? Uh, who's gonna do the contact tracing? And gotten these interventions, diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, so they're ready to go much faster. And so, uh, sadly, very little of that was done. If, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken here, those were the things you were saying needed to be prepared back in 2015. Did anybody listen? Uh, yes, there was a little bit of work done, maybe 5% of what should have been done. A group called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations was created that uh, made progress on a few of these vaccine platforms, actually, uh, that are amongst the first now that are going into human trials. You released a memo today uh, that says global innovation is the key to limiting the damage. What, what innovation are you talking about? What's the number one priority? What do we have to innovate first? Well, in the near term, it's the scaling up of testing and prioritizing who gets testing and getting the quick results. In the midterm, it's these treatments uh, that can cut the death rate down uh, potentially uh, dramatically and then the final solution, uh, which is a year to two years off, is the vaccine. So we've got to mm -hmm. go full speed ahead on all three fronts. Uh, just to head off the conspiracy theorists, maybe we shouldn't call the vaccine the final solution. Maybe just the Good best point. solution. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, uh, the return to normal solution. Exactly. Are you aware that there are people out there who have these conspiracy theories that this was all created by you in order to inoculate everyone in the world and put a chip into their blood so you can track them? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, very strange. Yes. You know, th that the organization that's about saving lives and warning, uh, you know, gets attacked as though uh, we were somehow connected to it. Well, if you don't save our lives, you can't control our brains. <laughs> now, you say that uh, the, um, uh, the medicines or the treatments that are out there right now, what are the things that you, do you have, do you have any knowledge of something that is sort of a leading candidate to treat uh, the coronavirus right now? Uh, there's many that I'm very hopeful about. The one that uh, is maybe the most promising is taking the blood of recovered patients, uh, the plasma, and then being able to put that back into people uh, who have the disease. Uh, that has a reasonable chance of working and in the next few months, we'll get data about that. Uh, you can concentrate the plasma down, so the amount you need to give uh, to help somebody is actually pretty small. Uh, so even in developing countries, this is intervention that could be scaled up and could work uh, in a powerful way. Do you have any sense of where the world is on testing right now? Is there a cheap and easy test coming down the pipe that we haven't heard about? Well, the testing capacity, if you're organized properly, is actually pretty high. These machines called PCR machines, there's a lot of them out there, but the government has to find them uh, and tell people uh, who should be prioritized to have access to those machines. In the meantime, there are innovations like a, a, a test, an at-home test, uh, that we could have as soon as a few months from now that would add to that overall capacity. And, that's really important because you're, you're blind. Without quick results, prioritized testing, you're blind whether your policies are gonna cause a surge 
uh, that would put, put us back into the bad situation we have right now. So if there is not wide testing, is there any way to know what the next proper step would be? Well, you'll always eventually see if you've made a mistake and you open up too much because your ICUs will fill up and your deaths will go back. What you'd like is to catch it literally three weeks before that by seeing the positive test go up and then you know that you've gone too far, that certain activities uh, need to be restricted even more than you've been doing. Clearly right now, uh, in most parts of the US, you know, the, the infection rate is starting to go down. Well, that's good news, but of course, no one wants to stay in this lockdown. And so understanding which things uh, create low risk and high benefit, that's the challenge uh, in policy we have today. Now, uh, it's, it's easy for us to say that the lockdown should continue because you're doing fine financially and, I, and I'm and i still working my job because of the technology that we have, but there are 26 million people, perhaps more out there, who are out of a job right now and it is perfectly reasonable to want things to open up as quickly as we can. Do you have any advice to these people, any words of, of patience or any words of hope for them as to how we can do it best? Well, we will get back to normal, but we're gonna have a pretty long period uh, of semi-normal and it's what fair does semi-normal mean what's semi-normal th that people will still be afraid uh okay. that people you know you're not likely to fill a stadium or a theme park even if the government said please please do you know people want to protect their health they don't want to infect their parents and so you know a lot of business models where you have to you know fill up planes or fill up uh you know restaurants they just aren't going to work uh, until we can appropriately get the risk of infection down very dramatically. And so I'm very hopeful that things like manufacturing and construction with the right protocols or even school with the right protocols, we can get those going. But we won't be able to do everything because we saw that caused that exponential increase uh, that, you know, unfortunately we caught it in time uh, before it got to the whole population, but not before substantial deaths. Now, I've heard a lot about uh, contact tracing, and you said that's very important. How do you do that? What is contact tracing? Well, the idea is that if I test positive, we want to make sure that anybody who I might have infected finds out very quickly before they infect someone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, this PCR test is actually quite sensitive, so we need to find out who those people are uh, that you can name and the locations you've been to and not only does that help you, us for that individual case, it gives us a pattern of what's going on. You know, why is meat packing, uh, you know, associated with widespread? Could you change that? You know, cruise ships were the first microcosm of this that showed us, you know, how tough close quarters are for it. So contact tracing, we need to staff up for that. We need to get that data. Uh, the countries like South Korea and Germany who've done this well, uh, they've been able to avoid the, the lockdown, and this is what will help us avoid the rebound. Um, the U.S. has cut funding to the WHO, and now you said in a tweet last week that this is just as dangerous as it sounds. How dangerous does it sound to you? <laughs> well, the WHO uh, is you know, a smaller organization than people think. It's about a thousandth the budget of the U.S. healthcare system. But it is where people come together to talk about the drugs and the testing and the statistics. And so I think once the, the U.S. steps back and looks at this, they won't cut the funding. Uh, they'll actually increase the funding because WHO is playing that central role. It's mm -hmm. fine to say, like everyone, they uh, could have reacted in different ways. But we need them. We need them to pull together all the scientific knowledge and get guidelines out uh, to the, the countries of the world. So I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, that we won't actually defund them because telling them to fire their people, you know, right now when we most need them would be a mistake. Bill, if you can just hunker down in the bunker, we'll be right back with more Bill Gates. <laughs> 